What is going on guys? Welcome back to the Hanacast YouTube channel and today I'm going to be ranking the 2023 Best Picture Oscar nominees. Now, this should go without saying, you know, if you happen to disagree with my picks, I mean, there's definitely some that you're absolutely going to be disagreeing with. That's fine. It's all subjective. Honestly, I don't think any of these movies are terrible. Some of these I think are bad, but none of them reach that god awful level. So there is at least that. Without any further ado, let's get on with number 10. At number 10 is Tar. Now, you're probably wondering, wow, really, Tar at number 10? My thing with Tar is that, good God, Lydia Tar is such an unlikable character. And I mean, supremely unlikable to a shocking degree. Like, obviously there are, you know, morally worse characters in media, you know, like Joker, for example, but they at least give us reasons to sympathize with where he's coming from. Ultimately, we don't agree with what he's doing and, what he, and obviously he needs to be stopped, but they at least give us an opportunity to see where he's coming from and see why he's having these problems. But with Lydia Tarr, when she's going off on her big rant in that one take scene uh, with, against this uh, one other person, it's like she is just ranting. She's just ranting about shit. And again, she's, she just comes across as very unlikable. And hell, the movie even shows us that she has a wife and a kid. And I'm like, this is a recipe for me to like this character, please. And yet somehow the movie still makes me hate her. And it's, again, it's not a character where it's like, I'm curious about, uh, you know, this douchey character and again she's obviously not as morally bad as like joker those people are obviously worse people but there's nothing that this character gives us that is just remotely charismatic or or at the very least shows us showing us where she's coming from you know what maybe show us you know, the troubles she went through to get to where she is. And so therefore her downfall in the film would come across as more impactful. But no, she's just this asshole character throughout without any sense of, you know, remorse or anything. It made it really hard for me to get engaged with that character and her journey. And it also kind of affected the pacing because I just kept checking the time and I'm like, man, like, can we wrap this up, please? And so for me, Tar, in my opinion, is the worst of this year's Best Picture nominees. At number nine, we have Triangle of Sadness. This is a film that gets interesting around the second half, but the first half is so pretentious and ranty. That's one thing I don't like in movies is when they start ranting like an angry old man, just like, why is the world like this? And it's just so annoying. And again, don't get me started on Woody Harrelson's speech in the film. Again, it just drags on. I'm just like, I don't care. Like, it's just, like, I feel like this movie, in a way, was trying to tackle the whole social hierarchy of, you know, the poor versus the rich uh, in a crazy way. And again, the second half, I feel like, is where the film gets interesting, but by that point, the movie's already half over, and only now is it starting to become somewhat enjoyable. At that point, the movie was just too far gone. At number eight, and this is going to be the biggest one here, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Now, I didn't like this film, but also for different reasons than like Triangle of Sadness or Tar. The characters are likable, and the message is really good. But my biggest problem with Everything Everywhere All at Once was that it just wasn't funny. And that's a big problem when you're a comedy. When you're a comedy... That's kind of like your big thing that you have to lean into. And I'm not saying you can't have substance underneath that, sure. But if you're a comedy, the laughs come first. But the problem is I didn't laugh at a lot of the jokes. Okay, there's one joke I will say was really funny. And that was the butt plug scene. That scene was really, really funny. But a lot of the other jokes, I just 
didn't really laugh or get into. Another thing that I didn't really like about Everything Everywhere All at Once is that I don't really like it when A24 goes too big. I feel like they just don't have the resources to make these big, grand films. You know, sort of like, uh, what was it called? The Green Knight. I didn't like The Green Knight, and one of my reasons for not liking The Green Knight was because it was clear that this was a very small budgeted film, which, hey, you know, stretch your budget out. But obviously, when watching The Green Knight, I'm just like, I could, I can see the budget. And that's one thing you don't want to do. When you're on a small budget, you don't want me to be able to see the budget. And with everything everywhere all at once, it's less so than the Green Knight in terms of like, you know, me noticing the budget. Like this is obviously not trying to be some big, you know, fantasy epic like Lord of the Rings or whatever. But even then, it just felt like it was too big for its own good. But again, the big problem I have with everything everywhere all at once is that it's a comedy that I just didn't find funny. And if you're a comedy and I'm not laughing, I can't really get invested into the film. At number seven, which is a film I like, but I don't love, is Top Gun Maverick. Top Gun Maverick, I feel like for me, was too traditional in terms of an action film. And what I mean by too traditional is that, like, it doesn't take that many risks. It's very safe. The flying sequences are really cool. And don't get me wrong, I do think this is a good movie. I do like this film. But I don't really get the whole hype that this film has. And that's the best way to describe this movie. It just plays it safe. It plays it just a little bit too safe for me. Like, there's no huge character arcs anyone goes through. There's no kind of, you know, you know, big, you know, story twists. It's just, it's a Top Gun sequel. I mean, it's it really is just a sequel to Top Gun. And it's not really doing anything that really took a lot of risks. You know, this is gonna be a bit of a hot take, but something like Star Wars The Force Awakens, that did take risks. Like, yeah, it had like a, you know, a trench run with its, you know, fighter, uh, you know, X-Wings, which was also what Top Gun Maverick did, and yet no one complains about that. But like, Star Wars The Force Awakens did take a few risks. Sometimes happily ever after isn't so happily ever after. And those different things are able to be balanced alongside the stuff that is familiar. Top Gun Maverick really is just all the familiar. It's all the familiar without really taking a whole lot of risks. And again, I like this movie quite a bit, but I don't think it's great. I don't love Top Gun Maverick. At number six is Women Talking. This was the last film I needed to see before making this video. And this movie's really freaking good. Like, the writing, it's really well done. And the cast is all phenomenal as well. Women Talking is about this group of women who are having a meeting amongst each other when one of them was assaulted by a man but you know that man is about to be walking free and the all the other men in the town you know the ones you know because they're in charge are like you gotta forgive this man or you're not welcome here anymore and so that causes a bit of a conflict amongst these women you know do they stay and forgive the man uh, who assaulted them or do they leave do they fight back what do they do? And it's just them talking. In many ways, it's a lot like 12 Angry Men, where it's mainly just kind of one spot, almost like a play. This movie really is framed like a, a stage play. Like, I could easily see this going to, like, Broadway on, like, you know, you know, in terms of being, you know, like, a dramatic play, like, not a musical or whatever. That would be really weird if they made this into a musical. And a lot of these kind of uh, characters, even uh, the character played by Ben Winshaw, like, even he, like, all these characters just feel like something that you would see in, like, a classic stage play. And it's done very, very well. Number five is Avatar The Way of Water. Avatar The Way of Water is my Top Gun Maverick. Now, granted, I, okay, I don't think it's like one of the greatest action films of the past decade or whatever, but this was a little bit more of what I was kind of looking for from Top Gun Maverick. This movie does take a few risks. This movie does have some, you know, dilemmas thrown at you. You know, when, when you see what happens with the Colonel, or actually, no, is he a Colonel? I don't I know. The one played by Stephen Lang. His kind of character arc in the film and what he's going through like 
that is interesting. It poses a bit of a dilemma. He's now in a Navi's body. You know, what, what does that mean for him now? And what does that mean for the future going forward? And there's also the whole thing with Kiri. What's her story? It, obviously, it's being set up for the future. All that, all of this stuff is so fascinating. I like this kind of world building. And like I said before, this movie does take some risks. Like, there are some characters that you meet in, in this film, and... Not all of them make it out. Like, I legitimately was really wondering, you know, who's, who is going to make it out? And I thought Avatar The Way of Water really did that for me. Uh, I don't think it'd be in my top 10 of the year overall. But, however, I do uh, think Avatar The Way of Water is pretty great. Number four is All Quiet on the Western Front. Talk about movies that really seemingly have been done before. Like, oh, the perils of war. Look how awful this is. But somehow whether it's you know dunkirk or 1917 or all quiet in the western front they all managed to find a way to make it a unique experience uh you know dunkirk played around with the continuity of the film uh 1917 played around with the whole one take shtick and all quiet on the western front well for one is based on a book from like long long ago and takes place in germany uh, during World War One, it is really refreshing to see a war film like uh, of this kind of scale from another country. Like, obviously, like yeah, we have the resources to do all that, but All Quiet on the Western Front had a twenty million dollar budget, and I can see why it got nominated for Best Visual Effects. Like, they th this is what I'm talking about: stretching that budget out, a twenty million dollar budget, and you get some really intense big war action sequences it's phenomenal to watch and again like it, it, the fact that this does take place in germany and that we are following german soldiers and it's made in germany all of it just really makes it a more unique experience and again i'm kind of surprised edward berger didn't get nominated for best director oscar uh, this year for All Quiet on the Western Front because his uh, direction here is so uh, not only horrifying but also very intimate uh, even, and especially once you see a certain turn that happens towards the end I'm like oh you guys are assholes in terms of some of the characters and it's just done so well I really loved All Quiet on the Western Front it is it's it's brutal but it's fantastic my number three uh best picture nominee this year is elvis i really really liked elvis a lot and the funny thing is i was expecting this movie to suck because it's like really are we doing another elvis biopic you gotta be kidding me like we're doing this again I'm just like, and uh, yeah, Austin Butler. I think I remember him from Nickelodeon. All right. But I mean, he's probably going to be good, but it's like, why are they doing another Elvis movie? Then I heard everyone raving about it. Like, yeah, no, this movie's really freaking good. I'm like, damn it. Now I need to see the movie then. And then I see the movie. I'm like, oh my God. Like, this is like the Elvis movie to end all Elvis movies. For one, I mean, yeah, Austin Butler. Austin Butler is phenomenal in this film. Granted, I'd still put Brendan Fraser and the Whale above him, but still, he is, like, probably giving one of the best musical biopic performances I've ever seen. And one of the reasons is that he's actually singing a lot of the songs. Like, don't get me wrong, Rami Malek was great in Bohemian Rhapsody, but I wouldn't have given them the Oscar because, you know, he wasn't doing the singing, he was lip syncing. And I know there's a lot of stuff into physical acting, and that, that is very important. But if you're playing a musician, a singer, you really should be able to sing. I mean, look at Joaquin Phoenix in Walk the Line, or, you know, uh, Renee Zellweger in Judy, or, you know, Reese Witherspoon in Walk the Line, or, uh, what was her name? Uh, Jennifer Hudson in Respect, like, especially Jennifer Hudson in Respect. That performance did not get enough love but austin butler as elvis 
Again, he just knocked me out. Again, that's the Elvis performance to beat all other Elvis performances. And he also wasn't doing an Elvis impression. Like he wasn't like, oh, thank you, thank you very much. Like, no, he, he, he does have that deep Southern draw to him, but he actually sounds like a normal person. It doesn't come off as a caricature of Elvis. He just comes across like Elvis. And the film's cinematography, editing, sound mixing, oh my God, all of that was just like, it, it had me dead on the floor. I was like, this is incredible. And for that reason, and again, I was surprised over Elvis. I did not think it was gonna be all that good, but for that reason, Elvis is my number three pick. At number two is the Banshees of Inishirin. The Banshees of Inishirin, I was already looking very much forward to because I loved three billboards outside of Ebbing, Missouri. And when I heard that he was going to be doing a movie this year called The Banshees of Inishir, and I was like, all right, I'm, re I'm really interested to see where this goes. And then I saw the trailer and I was like, all right, this looks really funny. And this movie definitely does have some laughs, but it's very dark, like almost kind of fucked up in some ways. For one, this is probably one of the best written movies of the year. I would probably give it original screenplay, maybe. I have to think on that. But the dialogue, it's, it is just snappy as hell. I love it. That wouldn't be a sin, Father, would it? No, but it isn't very nice either. And the funny thing is, like, I'm a, I, I watch Jacksepticeye. Like, that's one of the big YouTubers I watch. And hearing him describe Irish culture and how Irish people talk, and then watching this movie, I'm like, oh my god, this is exactly how Jack Septicai describes Irish culture. Even the whole awards campaign where it's like, for your consideration, best feckin' picture. Like, that stuff is just so funny. I really, really love the Banshee of Venice Sheeran. And, well, I mean, it's not a surprise because it's the only one left. Number one is The Fablemans. This just shows why Oscar bait Spielberg is the GOAT. Like, look, say what you will about his blockbusters, whether it's, you know, like, you know, sometimes you'll have Ready Player One, which is pretty good, and then you'll have the BFG, and also Indiana Jones the King of the Crystal Skull. Like, his blockbusters are more hit or miss, but whenever he's doing, like, these Oscar bait movies, like Lincoln, like The Post, like West Side Story, like The Fablements, they're always fantastic movies. I always love them. And The Fablements is no exception. Like, there are many points in the movie where I'm like, okay, I'm not exactly sure what, where these characters are going. I'm I'm not sure if I'm, if I'm following this really well. And then, when the characters start having their payoffs... It's like everything starts making sense. I'm like, oh, like now, like I'm starting to get more behind with Seth Rogen's character and Michelle Williams' character. All of the, like things just start adding up to where I'm like, oh, like that's the best part about the, about the Fablements. It's the payoffs. Like, you know, certain characters, you know, go through certain things and some characters come across as archetypes, but when you see what it pays off to, it works so well. And my God, the John Ford scene. The John Ford scene, that is like, oh my God. Like, it's so powerful. And such, just very simple lesson. Like, very simple things that that scene says. And right up, and right when you get to the last shot of the movie, and, and I mean the very last shot of the film. I'm like, God damn Spielberg, you did it again. You won me over. And I'm like, that is what I love in movies. Like this, like, like the stuff like in the Fablemans where, where you see certain things pay off and especially that ending, that's what makes film great. And it's movies like the Fablemans that make, that keep me inspired. And so, yeah, guys, those are my rankings of the 2023 Best Picture Oscar nominees. Now the question goes to you. What are your rankings of the Best Picture nominees? Uh, let me know in the comments below what you think. Thank you so much for watching. Please consider supporting me on Ko-Fi. You can uh, go on ko-fi.com slash Christian Hanna. I'd like to thank my Ko-Fi supporters, Fudd and Rooney Coaster. Uh, any and all help would be appreciated thank you so much for watching don't forget to hit that subscribe button hit that like button so you can be notified of future uh, videos well actually no the like button is for the algorithm man i can't speak today and hit that bell icon that's where you can be notified of future notifications for videos and live streams and if you want to see more click this